Hi, I'm Finlay and I'm a PhD student studying the effect of volcanic arc migration on individual volcanic centres by using the Atitlan Volcanic Centre in Guatemala. Multiple volcanic centres in the Central American volcanic arc show linear and age-dependent relationships, commonly expressed as paired volcanoes or as stratovolcanoes situated on the southern margins of large caldera structures. Previous workers have shown that the whole volcanic arc is migrating towards the trench slowly, likely due to slab rollback, but the effects this migration has on the relatively short term relating to individual centres are unknown. In particular, I wanted to see whether this migration increases the likelihood of a centre experiencing a large silicic eruption. I chose the Guatemalan section of the arc as it is free from the potential influences of regional extension that you see in other parts of the arc. The map here shows some of the important extensional structures in the region. I also disregarded Costa Rica as the migration pattern there isn't unidirectional and there is some overlap between the different phases of activity. This is the central Guatemalan section of the Central American volcanic arc. This region shows the migration trend very clearly as all of the centers apart from Agua show structures related to migration with a number of paired volcanoes and calderas that lie immediately north of the active arc front. For example, the proposed Shela caldera lies north of Santa Maria volcano. The Fuego Acatenango pair lies to the southwest of the proposed Barahona caldera. And Pacaya volcano lies on the southern edge of Amatitlan caldera. I chose the Atitlan center as our case study, as it has the most well understood record of its eruptive history. And this record covers almost the entire composition spectrum that can be reasonably expected at an arc volcano from basaltic andesites to rhyolites. The Atitlan Volcanic Centre has been active for at least 14 million years, and this activity can be divided into three phases. Each phase consists of a cycle of stratovolcano construction, followed by voluminous eruptions of rhyolite ignimbrites, which result in the formation of a caldera. Stratovolcano construction then resumes to the south and a new phase begins. The most recent phase started approximately 1.8 million years ago after a repose of 6 million years with the formation of the Tecolote, San Marcos and Pequisis volcanoes. The jump south, which is most obvious when comparing the positioning of Pequisis volcano to the two preceding volcanoes, shows that there was short term migration of the arc, after which the Atitlan III caldera was formed during the Los Chicoyos eruption. So here there's a temporal and spatial link between the arc migrating and the formation of this huge body of rhyolite magmas in the intermediate area. This Atitlan rhyolite was erupted in multiple events, but the largest by an order of magnitude was the 280 cubic kilometers Los Chicoyos eruption. If we want to tie this to a regional phenomenon, we can try and do so through the Tefra record. This figure shows that over the past 20 million years, there is a rough correlation between pulses of activity at the Atitlan Center and pulses recorded in the Tefra inventory of the entire Central American volcanic arc. We can say that at least locally, there was a relationship between migration of the arc and the eruption of a large volume of rhyolite. However, tying this down regionally is a little more difficult. We're using a mix of geochemistry and petrology to try and understand how the Atitlan rhyolite body was formed how it was stored and the extent different inputs went into it. So standard mantle derived arc melts, potential contributions of mantle melting resulting from a vertical component of a sthenosphere flow that results from the slab rollback, and any potential increase in contributions from the crust that might occur if we have an increased melt flux from the mantle or ponding of mafic melts at the base of the crust. I'm using a computational model to quantify the assimilation and fractional crystallization processes. Equilibrated major element assimilation with fractional crystallization uses major and trace element partition coefficients and can be also used with radiogenic and oxygen isotopes. Importantly, the major element partition coefficients are user constrained based on measured mineral chemistries. Unfortunately, we're running a bare bones model at the moment as lockdown has significantly delayed all of our lab time and we are midway through our mineral chemistry and isotope analyses. At the moment, we've attempted to fit the liquid line of descent recorded by our whole rock major element results using pure fractional crystallization. This has worked moderately well, but some of the major elements have been difficult to fit, most significantly potassium, where it's difficult to reach the high values recorded in the Los Chicoyos pumice. 
Assimilation is difficult to quantify without the use of isotope systems, so we are waiting for these results before adding this into the model. Trace elements are even harder to constrain thanks to the large range in published partition coefficients. As such, it is more important to try and fit the shape of the curves than to fit the measured values. The plots here show that we have matched the shape of the curves moderately well, but are in the most part overestimating the values. Here are the results from our pilot strontium isotope study, plotted against the sequence of volcanic activity at Atitlan, so the volcanoes get younger to the right of the plot. I've also included the values of two crustal rocks which are being considered potential assimilants on the far right of the plot, which are obducted oceanic crust and gryonodiorites and their associated pyroxenite cumulates. This pretty clearly shows that the oldest lavas, those that could be considered potentially parental to the rhyolite pumices, are actually much more radiogenic. This could be due to an increase in the radiogenic nature of the crust further from the present arc front. What this means is that the pumices require an assimilant with a less radiogenic signature, or that they have been derived from melts with a less radiogenic signature that for some reason were not erupted at the surface. Our pilot isotope study and the initial results of our modeling show that it is not possible to produce the Atitlan rhyolites by pure fractional crystallization, so some amount of crustal assimilation must be involved. If the estimate of the energy required to produce the rhyolite through combined assimilation and fractional crystallization is greater than that provided by the standard melt flux into the crust, some other explanation must be provided. This figure shows a conceptual model of the situation at the Atalan Volcanic Center approximately 440,000 years ago as the new line of stratovolcanoes was just starting construction and details some of the different processes that could explain the formation of the rhyolites. Multiple processes related to the migration of the arc front can be used to explain the formation of a rhyolite magma body. If there is a vertical component in the mantle flow caused by the slab rollback, there may be subsequent decompression melting of hot asthenosphere and therefore enhanced melt flux into the crust. This could result in widespread melting of the fertile hosting rocks. This explanation has been used for other ignimbrite flare-ups in the Americas. However, if there's no need for processes other than steady state melt flux, then the production of rhyolites around the time of migration could be due to the exposure of fertile, unfused crust to magmas rising through new melt pathways and resulting large-scale anatexis. Or, if there is a lag between the formation of these pathways in the crust over the new mantle melt column, then large-scale ponding could occur at the crust's boundary. Heating a larger region of the crusts during the migration event could also prime the region to store the rhyolites in an eruptible state in the intermediate area. The effects of arc migration on volcanic centers are poorly constrained. In the case of the Central American volcanic arc, there is a strong temporal and spatial relationship between arc front stratovolcanoes and large caldera structures. Our project uses the case study of the Atitlan Volcanic Center to constrain the petrogenesis of the large volumes of rhyolites that were erupted here, including the 280 cubic kilometer Los Tricoyos eruption. Early results suggest that fractional crystallization alone cannot account for its formation. An in-progress radiogenic isotope study will help quantify the different inputs, and then estimates of the required energy for the processes will allow us to see if inputs other than steady state arc activity are needed to account for their formation. Thanks for listening, um, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Cheers.